Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, April 19th, 2020. We are still in Unit 2 uh, for the spring quarter, which is entitled God's Promises, God Promises, rather, a Just Kingdom. God Promises a Just Kingdom. Our devotional reading from the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly is taken from Luke chapter 19, verses 11 to 26. Our background scripture taken from Esther, chapters 3, 5, and 7. And our printed passage or lesson text is also taken from Esther, chapter 7, verses 10, I'm sorry, verses 1 to 10. The lesson aims from the quarterly or number one, explicate the story of Esther as a triumph of justice. And that word explicate simply means to give a detailed explanation of something. Uh, Number two, since that treachery will not win, or I would say realize that treachery will not win. And then number three, commit to acting justly in every situation with the assurance that God triumphs over evil. Uh, the lesson has three major divisions. Uh, the fir- After the introduction, the first is a plea for justice a plea for justice, and that's covered between Esther chapter 7, verses 1 and 4. The second is injustice exposed. That's covered between chapter 7, verses 5 and 8. And then the final is justice triumphs, and that's covered between chapter 7, verses 9 and 10. Uh, From the standard commentary, for those of you who use that, our lesson title is... An executed scoundrel, an executed scoundrel. I may have neglected to mention the title of the uh, the lesson in the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly. It is Justice Prevails. Justice Prevails. Standard commentary lesson title is An Executed Scoundrel. Very quickly, additional aims from the standard or number one, state how Haman's plan backfired. Those of you who are familiar with uh, the book of Esther know who Haman is or was. Number two, suggest elements of the account that are most likely to be providential than others. Most likely to be providential than others. And that simply means um, relating to something um, or determined by uh, providence, and that's providence, or it is... uh, due to some intervention of providence, providence being providence. And we know in this case, it is God's providence or his providence. And while, and number number three, um, repent of a sin of omission concerning a time when he or she, that's you or me, should have opposed injustice, but did not do so. Was there a time when we kept silent in the face of injustice when we should have spoken out? Standard has three major divisions as well. Uh, the outline has three major divisions. The first is number one, scheme explained. It's covered between uh, chapter 7, verses 1 to 4. The second is culprit exposed, covered between verses 5 and 8. And then the third is scoundrel executed. And that's covered between verses 9 and 10. Now, um, you know, as as I considered uh, what is in this uh, lesson that will benefit us today, us Christians today, uh, as I try to do uh, when I study each lesson, uh, is I ask certain questions. What, <clears throat> what does the lesson say? Uh, what does it mean, and more specifically, what does it mean to me? How can I apply uh, any lessons from this lesson or this, these, the passage that we're going to study today 
to my life um, and and hopefully to God's glory. Um, and um, this is a historical narrative. I mean, it's it's something that is an, an actual account of something that happened. And it illustrates a principle that God has explained and repeats throughout uh, the Bible. Uh, and we and there's so many proverbs that basically uh, explain this principle. You reap what you sow, you know, and, and I'm going to share several of those from the proverbs as we get into the lesson. But uh, this is one, uh, a dramatic uh, illustration of uh, how this principle actually works. Uh, and it's something that happens uh, immediately. Many times uh, those who sow uh, evil uh, don't reap it for many years. And, and they have perhaps many successes and what have you before they ultimately reap what they've sown. Uh, but in this case, uh, the book of uh, uh, Esther uh, illustrates how someone uh, sets a snare, or sets a trap for others, and of course uh, is ensnared in it himself. And as I said, there are many proverbs uh, where God has explained this principle. Uh, the universal, uh, uh, I, I've called it and I've heard it called the universal law of the harvest. You know, you reap what you sow, uh, not the day you do, but later, and you reap and the same kind of what you sow, and you reap more than what you sow. So we're going to explain that, but I think what, at the outset, what we want to uh, keep in mind as we go through this lesson is what is God telling us, um, you know, more than 2,500 years after this account uh, that will benefit us, and I, I think we need to be careful uh, that we of what we are sowing you know we need to be sowing the right things good goodness and justice and and love uh so that we reap those things you know we need to be we need to guard our hearts so that we're not deceitful and so that we're not envious and 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 uh so that we're not uh full of pride uh and we're not many of the things that we many of the characteristics that we see in Haman full of hatred uh, full of presumption, uh, many things that uh, uh, from time to time uh, we may uh, uh, entertain. We want to dismiss those those things, those characteristics, and as I said, reap what is what is good and what is pleasing uh, in God's sight, and uh, and know that those things will ultimately be returned to us. So having said that, let's let's uh, try to get the context of our lesson. Let's uh, see if we can look at a little background here. The the account that we're uh, going to be studying today um, actually happened during the reign of Ahasuerus, Ahasuerus, or better known as Xerxes, uh, certainly by the Greeks. Uh, he was a Persian king. And uh, he uh, reigned between 485 and 486 BC. And uh, uh, if you've read the entire uh, book or even the background scripture, uh, you, well, you have to read uh, chapter one as well. You know that uh, uh, it was on an occasion when he was having a feast and his heart was merry with wine and. He wanted to show off his beautiful queen, Vasti, Vasti, uh, and uh, she was arrogant and refused to be shown off before his drunken uh, buddies. And uh, as a result, he was he became furious and decided he was going to divorce her. He did, and uh, he sought another queen, and he did that by way of having a, a beauty contest. Uh, and just to collapse the background here, uh, Esther, who was a, a Jew uh, and actually had been her, she'd lost her parents. She'd been raised by her uncle's uh, uh, so, uh, son, actually, who would, which would make her cousin, him a cousin, rather, older cousin for sure. Uh, she was raised by him, uh, and she was uh, a very beautiful and uh, uh, chosen to participate in the pageant. Of course, she was selected as queen. And this is some um, 
approximately five years after she's become queen. So uh, she's certainly gotten to know the king and, and his custom and his manner. And there were certain rules that forbade uh, anyone approaching the king without being invited. Uh, and, and that uh, was subject to death. I mean, if, if they did, uh, they were subject to a sentence of death if they did that. So uh, we're going to uh, just just also just to fast forward with the background. We know that Haman uh, was uh, <clears throat> a high official that the king trusted uh, completely. The king had given him his signet ring to sign various uh, orders and uh, uh, commands. And Haman had been uh, elevated to such a position where the king had ordered that people give him honor, that they bow to him and so forth uh, when he passed. And uh, Mordecai uh, refused to bow, uh, refused to uh, reverence him as he passed. And of course, that was brought to Haman's attention. And Haman was furious because of that. He found out he was a Jew. And so Haman uh, decided he <clears throat> wanted to destroy all the Jews throughout the the kingdom, the Persian kingdom, which included some 127 provinces. So he uh, persuaded uh, to the king to uh, allow him to sign a decree on his behalf that would have all these Jews. And he did not identify them. He just said, there's a certain people throughout your kingdom. They don't obey your laws and so forth, and they need to be executed. And so a day was set. For some 11 months from that time <clears throat> for these uh, Jews to be uh, basically killed <clears throat> by anyone who chose to and their spoils taken or their whatever they had taken. Uh, and, of course, the king, uh, as we get into the lesson here, we, we, we're amazed by his uh, um uh, his cluelessness, you know, and uh, he didn't ask about who the people were and he agreed to annihilate or have uh, Haman. Uh, commit genocide uh, of the a whole uh, group of people. Uh, anyway, so <clears throat> uh, this plot was discovered by Mordecai, uh, and Mordecai actually warned uh, King, uh, Queen Esther, and she said, uh, you need to do something about this. And uh, we know Esther, of course, knew um, the custom, the tradition that she couldn't approach the king with this without being invited. And the king, of course, had other wives. And, you know, uh, there was no set schedule, apparently, for him uh, uh, entertaining her or vice versa. Uh, so anyway, so Mordecai pressed the issue with her. And in chapter 4, verse 14, uh, he said, Who knoweth? whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And he is speaking of God's providence uh, in that verse. We know that God is not mentioned. This is, I believe, the only book of the Bible where God is not mentioned at all. But certainly we see him behind the scenes working providentially through this whole plot here. So on hearing that, Esther resolved in verse 16 of chapter 4 to go before the king and she asked that uh, uh, that the Jews uh, pray for her, that her maidens pray for her, or that they all pray and fast. And she said in verse 16, if she perishes, she perishes. But she was resolved to break the, uh, the custom or the king's command and, and approach him without having been invited. Now, having said all that, uh, we're almost almost to our lesson text. Uh, she had arranged uh, a banquet. She first approached the king. She put on her finest dress, uh, and she stood in the court, and the king saw her and, and, and held out his rod and summoned her, and she said, I'd like to invite you and Haman to a banquet this afternoon or today. And so uh, he consented to uh, attend the banquet, knowing that she had some request or some petition to present to him. And he asked her, well, what is your petition? He said, you know, I'll grant it to the half of my kingdom. Uh, what is it? But she said, you know, I'd like to have you guys come back again tomorrow for another banquet that I'm preparing. And so I know that was a lot of background, but this is where our lesson picks up. Our lesson picks up. Uh, in verse 1 of chapter 7, uh, if we back up to chapter f uh, 6, verse 14, 
It says, and while they were yet talking with him, came the king's chamberlain. And well, anyway, this is something else. This is something else. Uh, uh, the, the king's chamberlain hasted to bring Haman uh, to the banquet that Esther had prepared. Now, there's some more background that I think is useful, but I, I trust that you've read, you're familiar with Esther, you've read uh, chapter 16 as well, but uh, obviously the, the whole plot to destroy the Jews was hatched uh, because of uh, because Haman was incensed by the disrespect that Mordecai showed him. Uh, now, Mordecai had uh, discovered a plot uh, earlier in the book. He discovered a plot against the king, and without getting uh, going to the specific chapter and verse, uh, he uh, had uh, had that shared with the king. Uh, and uh, the and the uh, the men that were plotting against him, the two men that were plotting against him, were were discovered and executed, and then the, that that was recorded in the chronicles, in the king's chronicles. So the night of the first banquet, uh, uh, after the first banquet, the king was not able to sleep, and the king uh, had the chronicles brought to him so that he could read, and he read about this account where uh, Mordecai had discovered this plot against the king and and so he was imp really impressed by it and so the next morning he had Haman Haman come in and he asked Haman you know what should the king do for the man who uh, uh he wants to really honor and so Haman really lays it on thinking that the king is talking about him you know you should put him on put your robe on him you know put him on your best horse uh put your ring put your ring on him have him you know paraded through the streets and everybody show him honor and so forth so uh now he thought again the king was talking about him and then he said great the king said great great idea he said i want you to do this for mordecai i mean we talk about poetic justice here so haman now haman just uh his a spirit dropped like a rock then because the day before, the night before, he's plotting with his wife and some friends how they were actually going to hang Mordecai that day. And he had a gallows built that was uh, 50 cubits or about 75 feet high that he was going to hang him on before the second banquet. So anyway, so uh, and then the king commands um uh, Haman to lead the horse to lead uh, Mordecai through the streets so that he got this this great honor from the crowd. And I know we've taken a lot of time with the background here, but we're going to try to get through the text as quickly as we can. But you got to understand this. So now Haman goes back right after this humiliation. He runs to his house and he and he tells his wife and his friends, and they say, "Oh boy, if man, if the king is is really." Uh, honoring Haman that I mean the Mordecai that way boy you you're doomed you know of course I'm paraphrasing so again that that brought us back to chapter 6 verse 14 so the the the, the chamberlains or the eunuchs another word for eunuchs uh, went to Haman's house to to hasten to to hurry him up to get him to the banquet the second banquet that Esther had prepared so that brings us up to chapter 7 verse 1 we're going to read the first passage I'm going to read through um Verse 4 in the King James Version. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. And the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine, What, what is thy petition, Queen Esther? And it shall be granted thee. And what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of thy the kingdom. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me and or at my petition and my people at my request. For we are sold, I, I and my people, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen. I had felt my, I had held my tongue rather, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. I'm going to read that last verse from the 
from the NIV, verse 4 says, For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. All right, so from the, uh, again, from the uh, formerly, the title of this passage or this section, if you will, division is a plea for justice. And she is pleading, Esther is pleading for justice. She's finally uh, sharing her petition with the king. Now, uh, in many instances, um, uh, the uh, a petition for the king might have been drawn out further, but she really knows the king and she's sensing his impatience with knowing what it is that she's asking. And, and the, we notice the king addresses her as Queen Esther, which gives some weight to her petition. And he's already said, hey, whatever you whatever you're going to ask for, I'm going to I'm going to grant it. So just go ahead and spill it out. And also, uh, she's over the five five or so years that she's been queen. She's uh, demonstrated prudence, and uh, he knows she's not going to ask for anything ridiculous. So he has some confidence in her. So back up to verse one. So the king and Haman came to the banquet with Esther the queen. Again, this is the second banquet uh, after the first. Haman goes home, and I mean he is flying as high as a kite. He's thinking, boy, he is really in tall cotton. He's being honored, just him and the queen and the king. And so he is he's emboldened then to hatch this plot about just, hey, I'm just going to, you know, we're just going to hang Mordecai at one, of, at one of his friend's suggestions or his wife's suggestion, actually. And she, she recommended this, this, the, um, the, uh, this, this gal she recommended the gallows that was, was 50 cubits high to, to really, uh, uh, and that would be erected right in front of Haman's house. It would really show the disdain uh, uh, for uh, Mordecai in his execution. Uh, uh, 2A, and the king said again unto Esther on the second day at the banquet of wine. Okay, the king again is uh, drinking wine. We know he got a little hot-headed when he was at a banquet of wine uh, and ordered Vashti uh, that she come before them and then they dismissed her as queen. But in this case, it looks like he's keeping his cool. To uh, B, part B of two says, what is thy petition, Queen Esther? Again, referring to her as Queen Esther rather than just queen. Give some weight to the petition. And it shall be granted thee and what is thy request? And it shall be performed even to the half of the kingdom. And that's kind of an exaggeration, but he's repeated that three times. This is at least the third time that he's repeated to the half of his kingdom. And that was really just something to let him know that, hey, I'm willing to give you whatever you want. Uh, whether he intended uh, to give her the half of his kingdom was, again, I believe that was just an exaggeration there. Verse 3. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given at my petition and my people at my request. So so Esther is not going to hesitate anymore. She's not going to draw out the suspense anymore because time is wasting. Uh, it's been about two months since the uh, decree uh, was sent out. Uh, to exterminate all the Jews, uh, and uh, there's uh, there's less than nine months months left. Uh, and while you might think that that's a long time, uh, this was actually they were going to be destroyed the last month of the year. Uh, you got to consider the time for communications back in those days, and and the, and the edict went out to all 127 provinces uh, within the Persian Empire. So time is needed to retract that the command or that edict. Uh, and uh, again, uh, so she's, she's, she's thinking and she's not knowing that um, Haman had planned to execute Mordecai, which would really be uh, 
a, 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 a reason for not delaying uh, any further delay in her letting the king know what her request was. So obviously she knows the king uh, doesn't understand what she means by that. So verse 4a and verse 4a, she says, for we are sold, I and my people to be destroyed, to be slain and to perish. I would read that from the, uh, the NIV and it reads, uh, for I, and I think we re repeated this earlier, for I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. Now, this this doubling up, if you will, um, or this, one of the commentators says this, this heaping up of phrases uh, really is to emphasize the desired consequences, um, the dire, rather, dire consequences of her people. Uh, she's saying, be destroyed, be slain, be and perish. I mean, they all mean the same thing, but and they are intended again for emphasis. Part B of four says, but if we had been sold for bondsmen and bondswomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Again, from the NIV, that part of the verse reads. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, and not that she's desiring that that had been the case, she said, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Now, certainly um, in saying that, Esther's aware that God has delivered his people from bondage before, and he's done that mightily. He did that in Egypt, and certainly he actually... Uh, had a command given by Cyrus the king after their Babylonian captivity that they be allowed to uh, return to uh, to Judah. And we know uh, uh, both Esther and Mordecai were certainly of families that had not returned uh, back in 538 B.C. That's some almost 60 years uh, earlier. They had not returned, and so they remained in the Persian, uh, within the per Persian provinces, uh, or uh, Susan, if you will, uh, which is where the palace was, perhaps because of their livelihood, not really sure, family livelihood, not really sure. But so she's saying, uh, again, even if uh, they had been, uh, uh, some uh, edict had been uh, uh, issued that they would all be enslaved, uh, I would not think that would be urgent enough to, uh, and I'm I'm, paraph I'm putting this in my own words, risk my life to come before you uh, with this um, with this request. Verse five, and we're moving into the second division of both the uh, lessons uh, lessons uh, from the quarterly. It's entitled "Injustice Exposed." From the standard, it's entitled culprit expose verses uh five to eight verse five reads and in fact let's read that passage first from the kjv then the king ahasuerus answered and said unto esther the queen who is he and where is he that durst presume in his heart to do so and esther said the adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and, king and queen. And the king, arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath, went into the palace garden. And Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther, the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Verse 8. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine, and Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered his face. All right, so let's back up to verse 5 again. And it says, Then king Ahasuerus, 
answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he and where is he that dares presume in his heart to do so? Now, you know, at this point, uh, we have to ask ourselves, man, what planet has this king been living on? How, how in the world is he so clueless here? He, it's just been two months since he uh, very uh, thoughtlessly or mindlessly allowed Haman to sign an edict in his name using his ring, his signet ring, to annihilate a class of people, a group of people. Uh, so uh, it should be obvious who it is, but anyway, he's asked the question, and uh, and and actually, uh, I guess you could you could kind of rationalize the king's uh, <clears throat> uh, reaction uh, in in the f in three ways here. Uh, again, it's been several weeks uh, since he was involved in the issue. Uh, number two, uh, kings are, are they're very busy. And they delegate a lot of tasks to subordinates. And, of course, even though he was an exalted one, uh, Haman was a subordinate that I'm sure a lot of menial uh, and, and maybe official state tasks were, um, were delegated to. And then, then number three, the king is just now being made aware of es that Esther is part of the target group. Now, we'd have to go back again and give a little more background about that, but... Uh, Mordecai had told Esther when she was uh, actually allowed to enter into this beauty pageant to not let anyone know that she was a Jew. Uh, and uh, that was for, he thought, for her own protection because there was some uh, persecution and certainly ill feelings toward Jews uh, within uh, the king's court and elsewhere uh, in Susan. So uh, the king didn't know. The king didn't know what her background was. So that this is uh, that's a reason uh, maybe that he was kind of clueless, but it does. There's no indication in the book of Esther that the king ever inquired about who the people were that Haman wanted to destroy, which is kind of odd because you'd think a king that uh, would allow that would certainly want to do a little investigating on his own and find out if these people were truly uh, treasonous uh, and if they uh, uh, and who they were. Let's go on to verse, verse 6a. And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Now, just a few minutes before, in the king's eye, I mean, Haman was a trusted, loyal servant that he had exalted to uh, some great position uh, 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 in, in his court. And uh, she is really wanting to make it clear that it's it's not, you, uh, King, and I, I'm not blaming you for this. It's this, your your enemy. She's calling, when she says enemy, she, she means your enemy. The adversary uh, and enemy is this wicked Haman. And she actually uh, uses an adjective there that uh, I think is appropriate, not always advised, but uh Obviously, uh, there was wicked wickedness in Haman's heart to motivate him to do what he did. And so uh, she names him, and uh, she's, again, careful not to level any kind of accusation uh, uh, against uh, that would implicate uh, Ahasuerus himself or the king himself. 6b, and Haman was afraid before the king and queen. I mean, you know, we know the expression, uh, uh, he, he, he looked like a deer caught in the headlights. I mean, he was caught red-handed. Uh, he had nothing to, uh, uh, to respond with because he was guilty. He was obviously guilty. And uh, we know the Proverbs, your sin will, will, will find you out. And he has been found out he had no idea that this word would come back to the king through uh, Esther and certainly did not know that Esther was uh, a member or a Jew. He did not know that she was a Jew. Otherwise, he probably would not have hatched the plan, would have probably just limit, limited his um, uh, anger to uh, <clears throat> trying to execute Mordecai, unless in fact he found out that Mordecai was the queen's cousin.
So in any case, um, she, uh, he is he is rattled. He is really rattled. Verse seven a, and the king king arising from the banquet of wine. And I, I'm curious as to why they keep referring to it as the banquet of wine, but we have to assume that the king has consumed some wine and maybe is a little uh, lightheaded. Uh, <clears throat> but he arises from the banquet of wine, but sober enough to do uh, justice in this case. Uh, and the king arising from the banquet of wine in his wrath went into the palace garden so he walks away from the uh, from the banqueting area into the palace garden, maybe to just kind of get a grip on what he's just been told, realize that uh, one of his most trusted servants, perhaps his tr most trusted servants, uh, is uh, treacherous and and really uh, has plotted, hatched a plot to kill uh, his wife, his qu the queen, and her people. Now, and at this point, he doesn't know whether... Haman knows that uh, the queen is a Jew or not, or among the people group that he wanted to annihilate, 7b. And Haman stood up to make requests for his life to Esther the queen, for he saw that there was evil determined against him by the king. Now, I mean, it, Haman knew the king, and he knew when the king had uh, judgment lent and, and capital punishment on his mind uh, as a result of uh, some offense or some treachery, uh, and he had probably seen the king give orders for executions, such as he did for those who plotted against him earlier in the in the book. Now, um, so he, he's his only hope is now to make an appeal to to Queen Esther. You know, hey, you know, I'm 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 really not. You know, I didn't know. I didn't know that you were part of this group. And, and he's trying to explain how he was offended, maybe. Uh, by Mordecai again, not knowing Mordecai is her cousin, and and that and he anyway he's trying to make a plea for his life. He recognizes the king is determined to do him evil, um, and so in those days they didn't sit around at a table and banquet. <laughs> they lied on couches. In this particular culture, they had uh, what were little beds or couches that they reclined on, and they ate. And so the queen is reclined on her couch, uh, and maybe I would imagine these are kind of like day beds. And and Haman is 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 so um, uh, uh, determined to try to persuade her to make to to plead for his life, or spare him, if you will, that he kind of falls over on her couch. Uh, he he may have been bowing down to her and pleading, and which is ironic because uh, Haman's was offended by Mordecai not bowing to him and showing him reverence. And here he is bowing to a, the queen who is a Jew and pleading for his life. Uh, great irony there. Uh, so let's go on and, uh, to verse 8a. Then the king returned out of the palace garden into the place of the banquet of wine. And Haman was fallen upon the bed whereon Esther was. Now there were there were really strict customs about uh, approaching uh, a nobleman's uh, a wife, and certainly the king's wife. There was what was referred to by one of the commentators as the law of the of the, of the harem, uh, and actually uh, they didn't have uh, what. Well, they had the equivalent of the harems back in those days where the wives of the king and their servants, their female servants, and only uh, con I mean, eunuchs. In this uh, book, they're referred to as chamberlains, but they were eunuchs. They were men that were able to do things that women weren't, that were allowed among these women in these harems for various reasons. Uh, and uh, uh, not Haman certainly knew he was violating her space and it was and it was really something that was that offense was punishable in and of itself by death. So part B says Then said the king, Will he force the queen also before me in the house? As the word went out of the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Now I don't know if the king really thought that Haman was trying to make a play for for her, but it it was awkward looking, and it was uh, 
disgraceful and uh you know it was a, a bad thing to disgrace kings back in those days so uh that uh was a clue to one of the king's servants hey uh Haman's time is up here uh let's cover his face and that was really um an indication that he was about to be executed okay let's move into our final section uh, from the quarterly justice triumphs and from the uh, standard scoundrel executed and that's covered between verses 9 and 10 I'll read those from the King James Version and Harbona one of the chamberlains and again that means eunuch eunuchs said before the king behold also the gallows 50 cubits high which Haman had made for Mordecai who spoke who spoken good for the king standeth in the house of Haman then the king said hang him thereon verse 10 so they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai then the king's wrath was pacified or um, in the in the uh, NIV it says the king's fury subsided uh, so the king's judgment is swift uh, it is uh, just and uh, let's back up again to uh, part A of 9 Harbona and Harbona one of the chamberlains said before the king uh, behold the gallows 50 cubics high that's about 75 feet uh, and by the way, uh, Harboni was no doubt one of those eunuchs who Esther had befriended. She befriended some of the eunuchs. They really loved her. They not just because she was beautiful, but her personality, and and they really liked her more than the other wives. Uh, that's indicated uh, earlier. If we could go back to uh, chapter two, verses eight and nine, and fifteen, and uh, chapter four, verses four and five. Uh, and um, so, and then they actually were used by her to communicate to Mordecai and, and so forth, and he to them, to her rather. Uh, and um, so he is aware uh, of what Haman was planning for Mordecai. And uh, this gallows, 50 cubics high, uh, I think they call it a pole in the. Uh, in the NIV uh, was erected in front of Haman's house. Haman was going to have this execution uh, made uh, a real uh, spectacle in front of his house that he could uh, gloat during. Uh, and uh, the gallows being that high was an exaggeration again, uh, uh, at which really uh, uh, was was to was to indicate his his great hatred for this particular man. Now, he says, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good of the king, standeth in the house. And again, the king has been recently reminded of what Mordecai did in, in discovering the plot and warning the king uh, about the plot, and that saved his life. And so, really, uh, the king is going to return the favor. He's going to he's saving Mordecai's life. Uh, in executing this man or preventing him from being hanged. Now, uh, and the king's uh, answer is is, re is really <clears throat> direct and straightforward. Part B of 9 says, Then the king said, Hang him thereon, or hang him on it. And again, uh, talk about all the proverbs that come to mind. Uh, you reap what you sow, and you know uh, we're going to share some of those in just a minute. Uh, is this is this? It doesn't usually happen. It doesn't always, let me say, happen uh, as quickly. Uh, justice is not always executed as quickly uh, as it is in this case. Uh, but uh, God has shown us throughout the Bible uh, many, many cases where people's evil is returned to them where they suffer the consequences of of great evil uh, perpetrated against God's covenant people especially uh, we know uh, there was a very drawn out affair in uh, 
uh, in Egypt with the judgments that God uh, pronounced and executed uh, as he was calling his people out of Egypt, out of bondage. But ultimately, the, uh, the last judgment came out of the, the Pharaoh's mouth. The Pharaoh declared that the firstborn of every Hebrew was going to be killed, and God turned that about and caused that to happen to the firstborn of every Egyptian. So verse 10 reads, So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified, or the king's fury subsided. Now, uh, the uh, if you went on to read further, uh, we know that uh, uh, Esther in the next chapter then tells the the, the, the king, hey, hey, the, the, edict, the edict has gone out. I mean, really, we got to do something. Got to send out a new order uh, to prevent uh, our people from being slaughtered. Uh, and then um, actually the king had Mordecai come into the court and basically he replaced Haman. And g he gave uh, the queen Haman's house, by the way, which I imagine was substantial gave Mordecai his ring, said, hey, you write the, the new law and sign it with my, and seal it with my signet ring. And so we know that they did write a law that allowed the Jews to defend themselves. And uh, of course that prevented the slaughter that was planned. Uh, and we know that what resulted from that, the real Bible students, uh, was uh, the uh, Feast of Purim, uh, and uh, that derived from the word pure. Uh, and we can look at verses, uh, look at chapter 9, verse 24 and 26. Uh, and uh, that's commemorated every year, even to this day. Uh, I, said, I said at the outset, uh, all kinds of uh, proverbs came to mind uh, as I was thinking about the real purpose of, uh, or what the takeaways from this lesson would be for us. And I'm going to just share just a very few of them. Uh, there are many. The Bible is is full of them. But from Proverbs chapter 11, uh, let's take a look at verses 5 and 6. And, it, and they read, The righteous of the perfect shall direct his way, but the wicked shall fall by his own wickedness. Verse 6. The righteousness of the upright shall deliver them, but transgressors shall be taken in their own naughtiness. Now again, all comes down to universal law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. The, right, the righteous is showing, uh, or sowing if you will, righteousness, they're sowing goodness and justice, and they'll be delivered and, and shown the same. The wicked are, are sowing uh, wickedness and evil, uh, and they will fall, again, verse 5 says, by his own or their own wickedness. Uh, let's take a look at uh, uh, let's take a look at uh, Chapter 26, uh, verse 7. This is Proverbs 26, verse 7. And it reads, 27, I'm sorry, 26, 27. And it reads, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein. He that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. Now, the digging a pit for somebody else to fall in. Uh, and it says they're going to fall in it themselves. They're rolling a stone as a trap for somebody else that they hope will crush someone else, and they're going to be crushed by it themselves. Just a couple more, and we're going to close out here. There's many, many, as I said. Uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 9, verse 16. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executed. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Okay, and then uh, Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2, which is often uh, misquoted or misinterpreted. Judge not that ye be not judged, for with what judgment ye judge, it shall be judged, and ye shall, rather ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. 
Now, that's often uh, used to suggest that we shouldn't judge, not judge at all, not judge evil, not have any discernment at all, but that's not what is meant there. And then one last one here uh, from Proverbs 28, verse 10. Whosoever causes the righteous to go astray in an evil way, he shall fall himself into his own pit, but the upright shall have good things in possession. And then uh, to, in closing, uh, we just want to remember that uh, these uh, uh, proverbs apply to uh, Christians and non-Christians, to believers and non-believers. Uh, so uh, we want to make sure that we are sowing the right things when we uh, um, uh, have evil in our heart. And hopefully we, we, we never do uh, or, or very rarely and we quickly confess the sin and forsake it. Uh, we need to realize that uh, whatever uh, we might uh, uh, attempt to do uh, for evil, uh, that that evil will return to us. Whatever sin uh, we might commit, uh, that sin would be disclosed and return and returned again again to us in kind. So I think we want to be very careful. The takeaway again is uh, not only to recognize that uh, the fate of the the uh, the the unsaved when they commit uh, evil, uh, but also when they sow evil and wickedness because of uh, the uh, the evil characteristics of their heart. I mentioned many. Uh, earlier, pride, uh, arrogance, jealousy, whatever, uh, we want to make sure that we don't fall into the same trap. So I hope we've learned something from this. We know it's been an historical narrative, and I know I've run, run very long and will do better next time. But we pray that God will bless you and keep you. Certainly uh, in these uh, trying and unprecedented times, we pray that you will be enjoying God's peace, that peace that passes the understanding of this world as we place our trust completely in him. In Jesus' name. Amen.